Okay, so thank you to the conference organizers for inviting me. I'm going to talk about codon reassignments in yeast. And what is a yeast? Well, it's a unicellular fungus. Uh, so pretty much any time we see a fungus that under the microscope seems to be living in this unicellular way, we say, that's a yeast. And this is opposed to a filamentous fungus, which uh, under the microscope, it grows in these uh, filament-like mycelial structures called mycelia and form these sort of macroscopic things like mushrooms. Uh, however, if we're going to be that simple about it, we might as well just say that a whale is a fish because it's an animal and, you know, it's streamlined, it has fins, it lives in the water, so they're the same thing. Or moreover, even uh, that, the, uh, that the beaver is also a fish, um, and indeed this was once decided by the Catholic Church, I know this because I read it in Scientific American, uh, <laughs> that they decided a beaver was indeed a fish because I guess people were trapping them and not just using their furs, but eating the meat as well. But if it was during Lent and you were Catholic, you couldn't do that unless it was a fish, right? So uh, <laughs> the problem was solved by deciding that the beaver was a fish. Uh, and this is apropos of us being in the last few days of Lent right now. And, uh, but also of a more serious point that, you know, these categorizations of things and classifications in biology are often not based on any underlying reality or understanding of the actual biology, but just more for our convenience as humans. And so buying into that possible uh, false dichotomy of the yeast versus the filamentous fungi, we have our separate conference for yeast and filament, you know, separate uh, books about yeasts or about the filamentous fungi. And uh, I'm even buying into that myself by giving a talk about yeasts. So, with those caveats in mind, uh, let's talk a little more about what a yeast might really be. So rather than it being a monophyletic grouping, uh, which, for example, fish are, right, it's better to think of it as a unicellular lifestyle that emerged multiple times independently in evolution. And we see this from looking at the fungal tree of life that has emerged through genome sequencing excuse me, genome sequencing projects. And so it's, you know, it's a, it's a polyphyletic thing that has uh, emerged multiple times on its own, apparently. And, you know, so even in the phylum of Saccharomycotina, it's not just, a yeast isn't just one thing. They kind of aren't all, you know, there's a lot of evolutionary distance within that clade. And if we look at the protein sequence level, the amount of protein sequence diversity just from the top to the bottom of this one clade of yeast, Saccharomycotina, which is home to Saccharomyces cerevisiae, is equivalent to the distance between human and sea squirt, sea squirt being an invertebrate animal. So there's really quite a lot of diversity within just a single clade of yeasts. So yeasts matter to us in a lot of ways. They can be human pathogens. They can be plant pathogens and thus yield agricultural, um, will affect agricultural yields. They're important to us, as many of us well know, in food and, you know, beer and bread production, uh, particularly Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is also useful as a biotechnology platform in producing recombinant proteins and pharmaceuticals. And owing to the abilities within especially the Saccharomycotina subphylum to uh, assimilate and ferment the diverse array of sugars that are found in plant biomass, biofuels. So these are just some of the reasons we care about yeast and that we might go ahead and sequence their genomes. And so for the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus in on Saccharomycotina. So this is zooming in on Saccharomycotina. We sequenced uh, 16 new yeast genomes, 15 of them from this subphylum and one outgroup. Uh, out and we did it for, so the newly sequenced ones are shown in bold, hopefully, and the ones, the genomes that were already available are shown in a smaller uh, print. And these genomes were selected for 
they're, for one thing, their phylogenetic diversity within Saccharomycotina, so you can see they're sort of evenly distributed throughout the clade, but also we were interested in the biotechnological potential of the yeast, and this is just to show a few compounds that the yeast in Saccharomycotina are capable of either subsisting on as sole carbon sources, in some cases fermenting sugars like xylose and arabinose, uh, starch subsisting on inositol and methanol as sole carbon sources, and also for um, the things that yeasts are capable, capable of producing. And this touches kind of nicely on a couple of the talks we just heard about mining genomes for more and better biotechnological enzymes for biofuels or for producing uh, valuable things such as fragrances or in the examples I show here, the glycerol, organic acids, and, and lipids. So this is a resource to our users, and we hope that, it, you know, we think that we've uh, discovered a great many of the, the genes through, this, through genome sequencing and annotation that are underlying these physiological properties of interest, and hopefully that will inspire our users to do interesting things like um, use these in a biotechnological context. So if, for example, maybe you were interested in doing a, a biotechnology context that in, uh, involves starch degradation. Uh, and fermentation, then if you were to take the pathway from Hypopicia bertoni, which is very good at growing on starch, and heterologously express this in the usual biotechnology way in a workhorse yeast such as Saccharomyces cerevisiae, it might not work. And why is this? This is because the yeasts do not all have the same genetic code. So, there's a clade of yeasts, which I've drawn a box around. They're called the CUG sear yeast. And at least for some of those yeasts, this has already been known since the, um, 1989, that uh, some of these yeasts, it was first discovered in a candida species, that rather than translating a CUG codon to the leucine that's in every other living thing, it's, it translates CUG to serine. So that's sort of a strange quirk of these yeasts. So basically, the genetic codes are not identical, and to exploit the biotechnology potential of yeast, we need to understand the codes and their differences. So let me just introduce the idea of alternate genetic codes and sort of what's known. So we have the central dogma of molecular biology where DNA is transcribed to RNA, uh, RNA which is then translated to protein according to these rules, which are the same in pretty much all of biology, but there are some exceptions, um, some which, uh, which Tanya just mentioned, and many of the uh, exceptions to the canonical genetic code have involved recoding of stop codons to some amino acid, and these were, you know, the uh, opal, amber, and ochre mutations described in the 1960s but also more recent uh, metagenomic studies that we've been doing at the JGI have been uh, uncovering more and more examples of this kind of codon reassignment, stop codons to some amino acid. It's usually got to do with the interaction between bacteria and their phages, but it's also sometimes seen in some eukaryotes as well in, in metagenomics. So, but then this yeast example of this yeast alternate code is a little bit of a different kind of thing because it's not the recoding of a stop codon to an amino acid, it's the reassigning of a codon from one amino acid to another. So as far as nuclear eukaryotic, geno you know, eukaryotic nuclear genomes go, this is the only one that's been characterized since it was first discovered in 1989. And this is quite a rare thing, and just to drive it home, you know, of the 17 non-standard codes that NCBI keeps track of, this is the only one that is a sense recoding. So uh, it's a rare thing, and it would be neat to discover another one. So we asked, since we're sequencing all these yeasts, some which we know are in the CUG seroclade, some which are well outside of it, others which are just kind of near it, we want to know, for all of these newly sequenced yeasts, what are the genetic codes? Is it CUG sero or standard? Or is there more to the question, might we discover other genetic codes within the yeasts. So 
in the, you know, in the more than two decades since the initial discovery of CUG SER, it was, um, it's emerged that this alternate genetic code is due to changes in the tRNA, where, not surprisingly, the tRNA has some features of a leucine tRNA, some features of a serine. So the first thing we did was to look at all the tRNAs with the CAG anticodon and identify these features. So, you know, obviously you expect to see the leucine identi identity elements, whether you're translating it to serine or leucine in the end, but also these serine identity elements, which are elsewhere in the tRNA. And basically, within the CUG serclade, we found all of the, C, uh, of the serine identity elements present in the RNA sequences. Uh, however, at the very base of the clade, two yeasts, Mechnicoia and uh, Babjaviella, have one or another of these. So it sort of implies being on the cusp of having this alternate genetic code. And this is interesting in context of yesterday's talk on the floral yeast, because that was a Mechnicoia species, not the same one as this. But I'm interested. OK, I'm going to speed up a little bit. So OK, based on tRNA, we think the CUG clade is still the CUG clade. So we came up with a method based on multiple sequence alignment, where we just made protein multiple sequence alignments representing the amino acids coded by CUG as X. And we just looked at the conservation pattern. Pretty easy. So in one case, it looks like a conserved leucine position. In another case, it looks like a conserved serine. Maybe we'll see something else. And we did this over all the codons and many protein families. So we only really found anything interesting for CUG. But here's a table of the amino acids of all oh, What happened? Oh, yeah, of all 20 of them. And a darker green color means more of the time the CUG aligned to that amino acid. So expectedly, pretty much, we see that the CUG clade all translates it to serine according to our bioinformatic method, and that the rest of the yeast look like standard. However, there's a couple of yeasts that look like outliers. Ascoidia rubescens has only 47 CUG codons in 550 protein families, so you can't discern its t uh, preference for what it translates to. And then, interestingly and unexpectedly, Pachysolon tenophilus would apparently prefer to translate CUG codons to alanine. So this is potentially a novel genetic code. You know, first one since this original CUG ser was discovered in 1989. So, but that's only a bioinformatics prediction, and you really don't know the answer unless you do mass, mass spec experiments and measure the identities of the translated peptides. And just to quickly go through that, out of about 7,000 peptides we were able to unambiguously map to the genome in mass spec experiments, uh, 178 spanned a CUG, 160 of those ended up being alanine indeed in the sequence peptide. Uh, the, the remainder, about 16, were interestingly the canonical leucine, and two were something else. So we conclude that Pachysolon tenophilus translates CUG codons to alanine, and we think that's kind of neat. And so just as a little bit of an example, here's one gene with three CUG codons showing where they were translated to alanine, and also that a similar codon for leucine, CTT, is still being translated to leucine. So just to wrap this up, we sequenced uh, 16 yeasts with diverse biotechnological potential and phylogenetic uh, placement. And we inferred a rare sense codon reassignment, CUG, to alanine, not canonical leucine or previously reported serine. And we confirmed this in mass spec experiments. This has some implications in biotechnology, because if we want to you know, exploit this new catalog of genes we've come up with, with uh, you know, potentially new and better enzymes for biotechnological processes, we need to know the genetic code. Because if we don't, it might not work. Indeed, transformations that we tried before with Pachysolon tenophilus did not work. If they had a CUG code on, we didn't know why. Now we do. And this also, in a yeast such as Ascoidia, which lacks almost entirely CUG codons, 
that CUG could be assigned to an unnatural amino acid through genome editing and used to produce unnatural proteins. So thank you for listening, and thanks to all these people. We have time for a very quick question. Yes. yes. Uh, is there anything interesting about the tRNA, the tRNA for the alanine, the CUG alanine, that um, you've been able to discern? There just is. kind of similar to the analysis you did with the other, yeah. There is. Um, it just looks different. It looks like nothing else. And, it, it, you know, I, I showed only a few of the yeast, but we looked at all the CUG tR, or CAG tRNAs and all of the yeast that we were looking at. And the Pachysolin one, it just didn't look like any of the others at all. So in what particular ways, I can't really say, but okay. cool. it looks weird. Thank you. All right, let's give Robert another hand. Thank you.